Hi, this is Ryan from Disruptarian.com, Clovistar Media, um, Clovistar.com as well. It is the 6th of December, 2015. Happy holidays to you. Uh, thing uh, I've been talking about since this happened in July, this Stephen Westfall uh, trial, this um, Stephen Westfall issue where a cop beat the living hell out of a guy who was fully detained, in handcuffs, posing no threat to anybody. Um, he got off, no, not guilty. Um, I said that, that that would happen back in August, you know, when uh, Stephen Herzog uh, was the prosecutor, you know, because the thing with these guys, you know, with the, you know, relationship that prosecutors and police have is that, you know, prosecutors have to do a good job or they get fired. You know, if they're not prosecuting people and getting convictions, then they don't keep their job. They, they get replaced. And these prosecutors depend on the police for their testimony, you know, to be able to get convictions. So there's a thin blue line that, prosecutors and police don't cross you know the the police don't go after the prosecutors the prosecutors don't go after the police they you know they keep it on the level and i don't think the prosecutor ever intended to do a good job in prosecuting stephen westfall i mean you look at what happened with you know like even the rodney king verdict they'd be the living crap out of that guy you know they got away with it um uh, so many of these incidences, it, you know, you see uh, what happened with that Eric Garner. You see all these incidences. How many times does a police officer get convicted when it's obvious, when there's when there's clear video evidence that they're wrong and they've done something horrible? You know, it's it's all you know a matter of them doing their job or whatever. Um, even the, pol the chief of police, the the officers that were there, they all said that he did not need to use that force. That was unnecessary force. But the, but the jury, I'm sure, and the prosecutor, you know, they've got this status atmosphere and this, you know, uh, allegiance to the state itself. So, you know, that the state is their mommy and daddy, you know, and, and for some of them, it's their, it's their um, employer. So they're not going to go against the state to, you know, convict somebody that's clearly wrong and doing something that was terrible. But anyway, he got off. I knew that would happen. I said that five months ago. I, you know, it was obvious as day. Uh, that would be um, the result. And here we go. Um, here's the thing, though. How, how necessary is it to, you know, uh, charge like James Rutherford, who was not guilty of anything, clearly? Um, so, you know, from the beginning to the end of the situation, and you can watch the video, you can watch the cell phone video, you can watch the whole thing. What did he do wrong the whole time? First, he's, he's confronted by a private security guard. Not even a, a you know state authorized oath taking police officer. It's just a, uh, a security guard at the IRS building, and the uh, the guy says, "Hey, I need to search you. I think you have a knife." And you know the guy James Rutherford, first of all, knew he didn't have a knife. He didn't have a knife, right? Um, police admit that. Secondly, he knows he has Fourth Amendment rights to illegal searches and seizures, you know, and, and able to uh, be able to resist and, 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 and uh, re reject legally an illegal search, you know, because it's not legal unless he's suspected of committing a crime, right? I mean, a police officer can search you if you're suspected of committing a crime, and that's, that's known, and that's, you know, universal in all of these police agencies throughout the United States. If you're su suspected of committing a crime, they can search you. If you're not, they can't search you. They can't even detain you if you're not suspected of committing a crime. So when they show up and the guy has done nothing but reject an illegal search, what crime has he committed, right? Nothing. I mean, he, he can legally resist that that search because he's not even suspected of committing a crime and they say well he was suspected of having a knife on what on what grounds and and what's wrong with having a knife is it illegal to carry a knife it's legal to carry a gun i can carry a gun in public on my holster in maine i can carry it concealed without a permit but in idaho i can open carry and take a gun anywhere in the state, especially in public video, uh, venues. You know, if it's a, a federal, you know, office, then federal laws apply, and the Second Amendment applies, and uh, certainly open carry applies on a state and federal level. So, I mean, even if he had a knife, there's no crime committed, none at all. Um, but he didn't have a knife, and so they had no right to search him, and they had no right to detain him, they certainly had no right to, to handcuff him. And then they say that he was resisting. I watched the video. I watched him walk out peacefully all the way to the car until they started, 
you know, putting their hands on him and slamming him on the hood. And he pushed back so that he wasn't, you know, getting his arm broken. I, I seen how tight his handcuffs were and how, you know, restrained he was. And putting that much force on the guy and slamming him on the hood could have easily broke his arm. So he pushes himself back to right himself. And, uh, you know, that's not disorderly. That's, you know, trying to prevent injury. And uh, they had no right to even put their hands on him to begin with. So from the very beginning, the cops were wrong. And all the way to the end where, where this Stephen Westfall takes his elbow after the guy is fully detained on the car, three cops holding him back, handcuffs, you know, and he, he comes over to slam his, his elbow into the guy's head. I mean, what part of that was necessary, justified, or even helpful? Not a bit of it. Um, obviously... Uh, not even his fellow officers believed he had any right to do that. But here's the thing, you know, uh, Idaho and many police agencies around the world get um, huge funding from their from their local municipalities. Uh, the police budget in Pocatello is the highest budget on the police or on the city payroll. They have more budget going to the police than anything. Um, and it, you know, it, it's counterintuitive because when they stimulate the economy, when they boost the, you know, economic budget, or when they promote jobs and, and industry, more people go to work and less people are committing crimes. So if they invest in, in capital gains, in gaining um, wealth and, and, and industry and jobs, then they're going to find more people working and less people committing crimes. But the Economic Development Fund in Pocatello has been $75,000 for over a decade. They've never increased it. The police budget, just the last increase they got was a $96,000 increase. And they do that every year. They're about to increase it again. And instead of increasing the budget to buy tanks and, and assault rifles and military gear, what they need to do is divert that to a economic stimulation so that people can go back to work and there's less crime. I mean, if they're really concerned about crime, um, you know, statistics and, and, and uh, research shows the more jobs and the more, you know, strong the economy is, the less crime there is. So I think they're doing things backwards. But, uh, and, and it, it, it totally makes sense that, that uh, Idaho is number 49th in the nation for median income. It also is hilarious um, that Pocatello, this place that I think is completely corrupt, uh, is the last on the list for median income in the state. So the state is number 49th in the nation for median income. And then uh, Pocatello is the last city on the list of economic um, uh, strength and for median income in Idaho. Um, here's, here's something I found, and I thought this was great that Mexico, um, there's a, a city, let me just see here, um, in uh, Alcapoco, Mexico, uh, the police went on strike. And after they went on strike, you know, nobody realized that they had continuously been on strike for weeks, and nobody was really concerned. Everybody was starting to comment, you know, and, and write blog posts, and, and I think even the Huffington Post picked this one up, that uh, the the traffic was actually running smoothly in the state or in the town. They they had less traffic incidences, uh, wrecks, and and other things, with no police present, and um, they had less you know issues with um, you know violence and things like that. Things just started straightening out, and normalizing after the police uh, went on strike and stopped policing the t the town. So, I mean, if you want to talk about you know the uh, effectiveness of police i mean how could things get better if there's no police if the police are so good for the community i mean this this doesn't happen very often where the police go on strike and i don't know the condition right now i believe they're back on the on duty but you know it's just interesting what happened here um this is and this was i think last year was this 2013 i, I remember reporting on this a while oh this was this was uh last year this was uh, about 14 months ago um, in 2014, October 2014. And uh, this week it was reported that police in Acapulco, Mexico went on strike and the people of the city, for the most part, do not seem to want them back. It turns out that without the transit police, there uh, is less traffic. And without the municipal police, there has been no noticeable increase in crime. Uh, Jeff uh, Berwick, 
Alcapoco resident and the founder of the Dollar Vigilante said the people in the city seemed much more happier since the police went on strike. In a recent report, Ber uh, Berwick explained how traffic actually ran much more smoother without the transit police. Quote, weeks went on and you could tell that almost everybody had become aware of the lack of transit police and no one was adhering to red lights and uh, if there wasn't any ongoing traffic, the majority of people began treating red lights like a yield sign. They'd slow down, check that no cars were coming, and if they weren't, they'd just roll through the red light instead of sitting there for a minute or two as traffic backed up behind them, he said. There's certainly a legitimate need for a wide variety of community and property protection services, but these services can be provided spontaneously by members of the community in a decentralized way. Anyway, it, it is interesting. You can check this out at the Free Thought Project. Look up the Alcapulco Police, and uh, it, it is uh, eye-opening. Anyway, this is Clovis Star. Uh, check us out at this.